Hi, I'm attorney Bill Bronchek, and I'd like to explore with you seven different ways that you can profit from a real estate foreclosure. Real estate foreclosures can be complex depending on what state you're in, but basically there are ways to do it that are almost the same in every state with a few exceptions that I'll show you. As long as you know the timelines available in your state, what instrument they use, mortgage or deed of trust, and how the process is done, either by a, an, uh, a uh, trustee foreclosure or a lawsuit foreclosure. Uh, mortgage states generally use lawsuit foreclosure. Deed of trust states generally use trustee foreclosures. In the end, there's a sale and you know you just gotta know the timelines in between. A good way to learn these is uh, my good friend Alexis McGee, foreclosures with an s.com there's a state by state guide there so just learning uh, you know what the process is in your state what instrument they use and you know, how long it takes to do each thing once you know that you can put into application uh, these seven principles which I'm going to show you right now okay so number one lots of equity now this is sort of the needle in the haystack, so to speak. Um, if you know that the foreclosure list you're looking at, and foreclosures.com does sell that list, and what I like about them is they also um, have the ability to look at a spreadsheet with the Zillow values, so you have a ballpark idea of you know how much equity is in the property being foreclosed. So if there's a lot of equity, uh, let's say it's worth uh, 200, they owe a hundred and there's you know twenty thousand back interest late payments attorney's fees and so forth you don't have to pay anything you know less than 120 assuming it's in reasonably good condition to make a profit let's say you can pay 140 and still make a profit it's just like any other closing at that point you sign an agreement with the seller and you get a payoff uh, from the lender um, just like you would in a normal closing, although it's probably going to be through their foreclosure department or the attorneys. And then you close just like any other deal and the seller pays off what he owes and maybe walks out with some cash in his pocket. You know, again, that's probably one out of 20 homes these days, but uh, that's a fairly straightforward transaction. And the only thing you got to be concerned with, in some states, in some states, there are foreclosure protection rules about 25 states have foreclosure protection acts that require you to uh, give the seller a right of rescission on the contract. So you, you, you sign up a contract, you wait three or five or seven days, and then you can go forward and go to a closing. Okay, it's rare that anything's gonna happen in that time period. You know, they might find another buyer, but typically not. Just be aware that those rules do exist and look them up for your state, okay? now. Pretty straightforward transaction. Number two, a little equity. What do I mean by a little equity? Well, with a little equity, again, let's say it's worth 200,000 and they owe 175. Clearly not enough equity to buy, fix, and flip. But if it's in reasonably good shape as a rental and the mortgage payment is a pretty low interest rate on it once it's fixed, meaning once you cure up the back payments, what you would do is you take the property subject to the existing mortgage. So the seller is going to deed it over to you in the closing. You're going to make up the back payments and hopefully that's not too much, maybe five or 10,000. And then you're going to just have ownership of the property subject to the mortgage. Now the mortgage has an acceleration or due on sale clause which says that if the seller transfers property, then the lender can accelerate it, but it was already in default and you got it out of default. So the odds of them you know, caring about the fact that you did this are pretty slim. But again, if you're only putting up five or 10 grand, it's a risk probably worth taking and you can just turn it out or rent it out for positive cash flow. Pretty good deal, okay? So that's if they have a little bit of equity, not too much of a back payment to make up and a nice low interest rate. Now, if there's no or negative equity, then the only option really is a short sale. That's where it's worth 200, 
uh, 250 is owed, whether a first and mortgage or a first and second, you're going to negotiate those liens down and you're going to sign a contract with the seller. Let's say that you agree to pay 140. You're going to present that contract to the lender or lenders with a short sale package, which is a bunch of forms they have uh, that they want filled out, financial statement of the borrower, why they're in default, et cetera, et cetera. And typically the listing broker will, if it's listed, will do that task. Or if you're just dealing with a for sale by owner, then you're gonna have to do it yourself or hire a company that negotiates short sales. Uh, so the contract is contingent upon the banks taking 140 as a total in lieu of the 250 that's owed. Okay, that's a short sale. And that's usually if it's break even or negative or really negative. Uh, now, the first three, are all done in the time period prior to the foreclosure sale. So whether you're in a state that has mortgage foreclosure, which is a lawsuit, or the trustee foreclosure, which is typically non-court involved, no court involved, or limited court involvement, at the end there's an auction. This happens, these three, all before the action the auction. So the subject to, the buy with equity, or the short sale, these are all in that time period. Anywhere from one payment in arrears to all the way up to the sale date, okay? And that, which could be six months, nine months, a year, you know? And uh, by that point, there's probably so much back payments that number two is probably not gonna work for you unless there's a little more equity, okay? Number four, the auction. Okay, so going and bidding at the auction. Now, time-wise, obviously there's only one time and place to do this, and that's the day of the auction. You can go on the county website where they get the information about who does it, where it happens, uh, how you have to pay. Like in some states, you have to pay all of it the same day, maybe some in the morning, some in the rest within seven days, within one day, within three days. Every state's a little bit different but it's an absolute auction. The lender, let's say there's a first and a second mortgage. The lender on the first is foreclosing. It's gonna wipe out everything behind them. The junior mortgages or junior liens, because it could be a, um, a uh, judgment or it could be an IRS lien or something like that, which is all behind the first mortgage that is foreclosing. So if you bid on that, and let's say in our example, $200,000 property, um, one twenty-first, one hundred second. That's a total of two twenty, and a miscellaneous of twenty or thirty thousand dollars in other judgments and liens. If the first mortgage forecloses, they're going to open their bid at one twenty. That's their opening bid. Okay, what they owe, and that's one twenty includes you know back payments, late fees, and attorney fees and all that. So if you get up there and bid. 121 and someone else bids 125 and you go back and forth where you win the bid at 140, you're the owner of the property. Now the only thing that you have to deal with are liens that are in front of that mortgage. And make sure it's a first mortgage actually being foreclosed because sometimes you'll get um, the information where it shows a $30,000 mortgage being foreclosed on a $300,000 property and think, oh boy, what a steal. But it's not the first mortgage being foreclosed, it's the second. And in either scenario, you're always buying subject to what's in front of those mortgages, okay? So what's in front of the first mortgage? The front of the second mortgage is the first. In front of the first are county property taxes, not IRS taxes, but county property taxes, assessments, um, depending on what state you're in, uh, some amount of HOA dues may be part of that. Um, any other kind of um, municipal liens like for water, sewer, and so forth are typically in front. Now, those usually won't be a big, big number that'll disqualify the deal, but just make sure you understand what liens uh, are there and what the approximate balance of those liens are before you go bid. Now, you're bidding blind because you haven't seen the inside of the house. Maybe you were lucky enough to get into it earlier, couldn't make a deal, and now you're bidding at the auction. But you have to assume if you haven't bid on the inside that it doesn't have an inside and bid accordingly what it costs to make an inside. Uh, don't get caught in auction fever, you know, bidding, bidding, bidding just for the sake of winning. Have a number in mind, 
go there and if you bid that and you win, that's great. Now in some areas, there's a lot of collusion that goes on. Little network, and good old boy network where you don't bid on mine, I won't bid on yours kind of thing. That's illegal, but it does go on. So if you see that going on, instead of crying and moaning about it, just get into the good old boy network and see if you can work that. Now don't do anything illegal, but just understand that if you go a couple of times to the auctions, they'll get to know you and you know, treat you favorably, let's say, so to speak. All right, number five, a junior lien redemption. In some states, when the first mortgage is being foreclosed, the liens behind that, let's say there's a second mortgage and a judgment or an IRS lien, they all have, by state law, an opportunity to redeem. What does that mean? That means basically pay up the auction price that was bid on the first mortgage. Okay. Now, um, if they don't have that, then the, after the auction is done. But if they do have that, like in my state in Colorado, there's a time period of a couple of days where if someone has a second mortgage, like in my example, I described $200,000 property, 121st, 100 second. If you could buy the second mortgage from the mortgage company, let's say for you know ten or $15,000, and they will deal at pennies on the dollar because they're about to get wiped out. And then someone bids, let's say, 130 as the high bid, and you could go in and redeem for 130 plus the 15 you paid to get the lien. Does that make sense? Judgments you can get for pennies on the dollar. Uh, now, IRS is a little different. IRS has a statutory federal uh, right to redeem, which is a little longer than the state right to redeem. And the only way to really deal with that is to call up the IRS and negotiate with them to get it off. Usually they won't waive you know, the penalties and, and their right to go after the borrower, but they may, for a sum, remove the lien from the property, and that's all you need to worry about. Okay? Number six, the owner redemption. So in some states, the owner of the property has a right of redemption after the sale for a certain period of time. So let's say there's a 30-day redemption. Whoever wins that sale, it's not over yet. There's 30 days for the owner to come back and redeem, i.e. pay up what the bid amount is at sale plus accruing interest. So during that period, you can go to the homeowner, give them a little cash, they deed the property over to you, you go record the deed and say, I'm the owner, I am redeeming as owner. Now, you, you just gotta be careful the timelines there. In some states, you can't do that trans transaction after the sale, you only do it prior to. And don't waste your money if you don't think that someone else, like a junior lien holder, is gonna come and out-redeem you, okay? So this is a little technical stuff, but just be aware that these rules do exist. And then number seven, REO. So let's say the bank bids their opening bid of 160 on a $200,000 property. No one else bids. Probably going to end up the bank owning it and free and clear of everything, the junior liens, but subject to the ones in front of it, the property tax liens and so forth, HOA, municipal utilities and stuff like that. Okay, so at that point, um, most people think you could just call up the bank or call the attorney who did the foreclosure and say, hey, sell it to me now. It doesn't work that way. It's a different department in the bank. It takes months for them to process it. Then they're gonna give it to a regional asset manager who will hire a local broker, who will list it on the MLS. Unless we're dealing with a local small commercial branch bank, um, you might be able to go direct to them and make the offer. But in most cases, it ends up on the MLS six months to a year later. And you know, you just make an offer and just like, it's like any other deal. You're just making an offer cash only from a seller and the seller is the bank that foreclosed it. Now, just one thing uh, I wanna mention there. When the bank selling is Fannie or Freddie, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, they typically put in their purchase contract, number one, well, most banks do this, the, the inability to assign the contract. So you can't put it under contract and then assign it by wholesale to another investor. 
But what Fannie and Freddie specifically do is they put what's called a deed restriction. That means it's recorded in the deed. It says you cannot resell this property for more than X dollars for the next 90 days. That means if you try to do it, the title company will pick up the deed restriction recorded and they're not going to close. Okay, Shouldn't be a problem on a fix and flip, you know, because by the time you buy it, fix it, sell it, you know, 90 days is going to get eaten up. But just be aware and look out for those deed restrictions, typically Freddie Mac and Fannie Mac. Okay, I hope you've learned uh, some good tips and nuggets from these seven different ways, and I'll just review them one at a time again. Number one, lots of equity, just like any other sale, make a deal, close. Number two, little bit of equity, make up the back payments, take ownership subject to the existing liens. Number three, no or negative equity, short sale. Number four, buy at the auction. Number five, Junior lien redemption, if it's available in your state and there are junior liens. Number six, owner redemption, if they have it in your state. And of course, in every state, they have REOs, that is bank-owned properties that are real estate owned. This is Bill Brownchick, and I hope you've enjoyed this lesson on the seven ways that you can profit from a foreclosure property.